So what we need to do is get study casts. We need to get radiographs. We need to check our bite relationships. We need to look in the mouth and go, hey, that's a healthy complement of teeth. Nose is no, nose size is no indicator of how patent the airway is. You can have a small nose and be totally blocked. You can have a huge nose and have no ability to breathe through there. I see this in an overweight patient, throw in GERD. Until proven otherwise, they're an obstructive sleep apnea patient. The condition of the dentition, the standard is you must have at least 10 teeth in each arch required for one of our devices. I say that's not enough. I say if perio is involved, it's never going to be enough. You will move teeth. You will change bites. The fewer teeth, that would not, I mean, those teeth would just be rolling over with your appliance. Uh, the dentition, at least 10 solid teeth. Even so, you're going to see changes. I think you need more. You are not going to be able to grab on teeth that are this eroded. They will break. You'll not have a good result. You can work with some of the dual arch appliances that have a softer inner lining they're going to be more difficult to use. Periodontal exam. You will have teeth moving. You will have uh, contacts opening up. Make sure you document perio. If you've not documented perio, you've not doc documented your open contacts. When they have problems and they're packing food later, it's all your fault. Periodontal disease. Don't treat without resolution of the perio disease. Check the TMJ muscle, the range of motion. I will tell you that here, some exercises you're going to be getting later to reseat the mandible are necessary, but there's a risk involved. In all of our patients, we have 25 million Americans walking around with undiagnosed joint problems and undiagnosed disc displacement. We pull these people forward in our sleep appliance and we are stretching out that retrodiscal tissue. We give them exercises to reseat the mandible in the morning. We can have them push themselves off the disc. If you have a patient that does not have a stable centric, has any uncomfortable situation finding a bite, get an MRI before you treat this patient. I'll repeat it. If you have a patient that does not have a comfortable occlusion, you cannot establish a stable centric. You very likely have an underlying disc disorder. You don't want to be the one that is the final straw that pops them off the disc or has them pop off the disc. If you even have a question, get an MRI. Do not treat that patient without an MRI. Uh, examine the nose. I don't, I don't use a nasal speculum, but you want to look in there, see what you can see. Uh, check for the nostril patency, check for polyps and large turbinates. This is supposed to be internal nasal valve collapse or external nasal valve collapse, the ALAR rim. You take a look at your patients, have them close their lips and <laughs> breathe in suddenly. In some of those patients, the Alar rim, the external rim of the nose, will totally collapse. In others, the internal rim, where the nose, the nares folds in, will totally collapse. Look at this. If you don't do something to open it up, they will not be able to breathe for the nose. They won't be able to use CPAP. They won't be able to tolerate your appliance. One of the things to check is what's called the caudal maneuver. You have someone breathe in, see what collapses, and then grab the tissue with your finger, pull up and out, and see if it keeps the nares open. If it does, you've got a couple of choices. Okay, looking in the nose. Uh, next size. Uh, with the nares, two choices. Use a, a nasal cone to hold the airway open. Uh, it's in the papers. I'll show you later how to order them. Or use one of the Breathe Right nasal strips to hold the nares open. When those strips are on or put on, they need to be in the correct position. Too high, too low, they won't work. Breathe Right strips come in 
the original or regular, um, extra, and advanced. I find the regular too weak, the advanced too strong, so that they're annoying to the patient. The extra work well and are tolerated well. Obesity, note the person's weight. Very often a 10% loss in weight will greatly improve their obstructive sleep apnea. Look at the tongue, look at the size of the tongue, scalloping of the tongue, blockage of the, the tissues in the throat. I would find it very hard to think someone's getting air into there. Battered uvula, inflamed tissues, snoring, inflammation. Look at that, inflammation. They're snoring, they're battering those tissues. Could you really get air through that airway? Choose your patients well. Please don't take a patient and say, they're referred to me for sleep apnea appliance. I can do an appliance and I can make money without evaluating whether this patient is likely to be a success. If you take on patients with too high an AHI and a lot of other comorbidities, you are not likely to help them. They will resent the money they spent. You will lose respect in the eyes of your physician and the dental sleep medicine field will lose respect in, in the field of medicine. So select for ones that you think you can help. If you've got a patient that you know you're not going to cure, but they will not wear a CPAP, they need to travel, and they're willing to try an appliance, document and have them sign that they understand you are aiming to help their situation, but you are not likely to produce a major improvement, but you can aim to help them. When are we likely to be successful with oral appliance therapy from Dr. Todd Morgan? The lower AHIs, don't try to s s treat a severe apneic with an AHI of 30, 40, 50, 60 with a sleep appliance. You'll be disappointed. A higher ratio of hypopneas to apneas, so there are lesser blockages. The degree of oxygen desaturation is less. You don't want to treat someone who's got an AHI of 38 or 45, regularly desats to under 80% and expects you to treat them and resolve their symptoms with an appliance. Don't treat someone if all you need to do is get them sleeping in a different position. But if that's the situation, you can all often help them a lot better. Uh, patient has a lower body mass index, they're not as obese. Narrowed arch form, that's telling you there's an airway problem that you can probably help. And also make sure the patient is there of their own free will. If you have a patient that is forced to be there by their wife, husband, um, the, the board of transportation, they are not going to be happy with you. So make sure they're, they're choosing to be there, they're not there on someone else's uh, will. These are my forms. Uh, they are my basic evaluation. They're a checklist. If you want to start treating sleep patients, don't recreate the wheel. I've got a checklist on my forms that if you will take it and use and don't go to one step until you've gotten the previous one checked off, you will have what you need to evaluate and treat patients. Give me another couple of weeks, I will have my updated form on my website. The address will be there. Download my form, change it in any way you want, make your life easy. What I have now, here's my treatment plan. What I have now is another page that says when treatment has failed, have I checked these steps. It's in the lecture, but it's also will be on the forms that come up to the website. Well, you are welcome to take them and use them. I have an informed consent. Always have an informed consent. It goes over the possible complications. You need that. In your insurance companies are going to require you to have an affidavit of uh, intolerance to CPAP and election of a sleep appliance. Even if you're in your uh, physician, has given you a prescription. Again, wait till I get the newest forms on because we've made some changes on the recommendation of the people submitting our insurance that let it, that makes it easier to get reimbursed. Here is the Epworth sleepiness scale. If you're gonna send the patient home for a mo uh, with a monitor, 
make certain that you have them sign something they'll return the monitor or be charged otherwise you will not get back monitors and if you're sending out a monitor that's four hundred dollars or twelve hundred dollars you'd like to get that back if they know it's going to go on their charge card if it's not back in a couple of days they'll get it back to you this is our delivery appointment checklist this is directions for the patients on using the sleep monitor that will change we're changing monitors the previous monitor we were trying to use is not that effective uh, this is the appliance use and care have people read it my recommendation is on all these forms make them read it sign it keep the original in the chart give them a copy so when the person says I never was told that you have the form that they've signed this is if you use a monitor and it's one that they take home for several days or a longer time make sure they have a sheet to note the results of the monitor forms I'll have them up in a couple of weeks on my website go to bobfinkeldds.com or bobfinkelsmiles.com look at the section that is information information dentists and appendix F will have the sleep disorder breathing appliance form it'll have all those checklists and you're welcome to them sleep monitors therefore in our hands they're for titration of the appliance they're for final evaluation prior to referral back to the MD for a follow-up sleep study and if we make the arrangement in our office that we can use them to send the results to a sleep physician for a diagnosis you can incorporate that uh, we have to define our scope of practice I have called the board twice and asked for an opinion on what is legal uh, they have not gotten back to me I don't know what it is what is legal in the state of Georgia at this point uh, coming in the next year will probably be a decision by the board whether you can dispense a sleep monitor and send the results to a sleep physician or whether that has to come from the physician we will know that you can use the sleep monitor for titrating the appliance and to help you get the patient where you want before sending them back to the physician sleep monitors you want one my original ones had no belt you need them now because we're understanding the importance of RERAs you want to be able to take a look at the sleep form you want to see what your RI is which is going to be our AHI we are going to need to know positional uh, REM events you're going to want to have an idea how to read the data off these and diagnose from that or at least work with your physician basic sleep monitor are you sleep mo are you sleeping monitor very inexpensive 400 bucks from ResMed all it does is tell you if someone's breathing in and out through the nose I used a lot of these the problem is you spend money on it if someone's not a nose breather or they've got congestion or they had a drink of alcohol or they took Viagra they're not going to work so I've got a lot of are you sleeping monitors that aren't doing me any good the wrist ox is very good it's very simple 800 900 bucks you put it on the wrist and it has algorithms to tell you what the person's doing with sleep relative to how well they're oxygenating their blood and what their pulse is doing this apnea link I do the apnea link plus with the belt Aries is the blue one that goes on the head that you may see a lot of they these two the Aries and the apnea link plus will give you their version of what are rare is so they're two worth looking at again scope of practice and what you're going to do with the monitor here's the new ResMed apnea link they may be calling it the apnea link plus but that does give you rare is very inexpensive it's a good little monitor I did, what I didn't like about them is their original ones had a lot of plastic pieces and the things broke off I think this is much improved but I don't have one this is the Minolta pulse ox it's cons if all you want is a pulse ox it's considered the best because it measures the uh, oxygen saturation level much more rapidly than most this is the are you sleeping monitor all it is is a nasal cannula this is the one I'm using now for basic screening it's a known in wrist ox very good they have some good algorithms that will tell you what's happening with the patient I will be using a much more effective sleep monitor it, it really is needed to tell me what I want